Oh, do we start? Oh, gee, sorry, folks. I was just reading this crazy story that my friend just sent me. It's actually pretty scary. Ugh. But it can't be true. The facts just don't add up. Has this ever happened to you? Ever run across a news story that turned out to be, well, something else, like an advertisement? What's the deal with that? I thought the news was supposed to tell me what's really happening, not this. Today we'll analyze the different institutions that determine the principles and direction of journalism and media in America. In this series, we challenge you with two questions to consider. The first is this. How does the media and media policy interact in a way that influences the policy-making process? The essential question for this lesson is this. What institutions determine the principles and direction of journalism and media in America? Come along! So people, the last series we covered looked at the influence of public opinion on the policy-making process. We know that in a republic, the public holds representatives accountable to public opinion. This relationship creates a situation in which special interest groups, in order to influence policy, not only hire people to lobby government officials, but they also lobby the public. Wait a second. The public? That means us, you and me. But how do they do it? Well, I don't know about you, but I can't recall a time when I was approached by a lobbyist. But that's because they don't go knocking on doors to sway public opinion. Instead, they use the media to try and sway public opinion. Double, double word alert! The media, which includes the press, is defined as the main means of mass communication through publishing, broadcasting, and the internet. Journalism is defined as the activity or profession of writing for newspapers, magazines, or news websites, or preparing news to be broadcast. The framers envisioned the press as the fourth branch of government. Why? Because it provides a vital check on government by democratizing information and framing political issues. So technically the media, the internet, and broadband cellular networks are all also public goods that utilize the public spectrum. Private platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter host user-created content that utilize the public spectrum and, as such, these platforms act as a virtual public space in which the public discussion takes place. This relationship creates tensions that raise questions in the current debates about the role of media in policy creation and the role of policy in regulating the media. As we have learned, navigating these tensions is ultimately the responsibility of citizens like you and me. The First Amendment prohibits government interference in speech and the press. Most conversations about maintaining a free press leaves out a crucial point, however. The framers understood a free press as being separate from the other power structures, whether government or commercial. Thomas Jefferson described the press as an important check on corruption and control when he wrote, The way to prevent these irregular interpositions of the people is to give them full information of the affairs through the channel of the public papers. In other words, the way to stop factionalism and corruption is to give the people the truth. To the framers, the news, although published privately, is a public good meant to help the public guide policy and control the government as well as private and commercial interests. The purpose of this free flow of good information works to prevent authoritarianism. You see, freedom of speech and press are considered the cornerstones of self-government and democracy. But the commercialization of the media can and has created challenges. Commercial interests threaten the integrity of journalists, and this has an impact on policy. Because of this, it is vital that citizens see themselves as mediators between the media and the government in order to determine policy relations between the two. It's time for a show what you know. How does the First Amendment prohibit government suppression of speech in the press? What is the government's role in ensuring a free press exists? What is the role of the citizen in maintaining a free press?
Do you like watching commercials? What? Some people do. Aside from being a general annoyance when we are trying to watch a video online or something on cable, commercials and the businesses that create them actually have tremendous importance. Word alert! Commercialization refers to the production and or management of something primarily for financial gain. Commercialization in the media means producing and spreading news to make a profit. What could be bad about this? Well, a lot. In fact, the Communication Act of 1934 was put in place to set some parameters around commercialization of the media. This act did two things. First, it established the electromagnetic spectrum as a public good, which would require licensing from the federal government for businesses to use. However, and most importantly, it set the precedent for industry to self-regulate rather than setting aside a specific percentage of the spectrum for public broadcasting, and it failed to establish fully funded public media. In reaction to commercialized media, journalism became professionalized in an attempt to create clear boundaries between objective news, government messages, and commercials. But over time, media companies were consolidated through corporate mergers and acquisitions, and this reduced the number of competing views. These mergers continue to happen today. Commercialization presents challenges to the news as a true public good. You see, commercialization prioritizes profit over purpose. And this focus on profit lowers journalistic standards and the quality of news. Think about it. If the news has a story that makes their parent company lose profit, there becomes an incentive to, well, downplay certain parts of the story and emphasize others. Advertising also becomes a key source of revenue and in turn influences what news is allowed to be covered. Because of this alliance, official sources from government and corporate institutions become a cheap and important source. As an example, in the lead up to the Iraq war in 2003, 80% of TV news reports were from official sources. However, eventually, the official cause of the war, Iraq's apparent hidden stockpile of weapons of mass destruction, was debunked. A lack of investigative reporting meant the media had to rely on official government statements. These trends started in the last half of the 20th century and have grown exponentially during the digital revolution to the point where very few media outlets exist and social media giants dominate the public sphere. Before we go any further, time to show what you know. How did the commercialization of media impact journalism? How did these changes impact the type of information available to the public? Well, you know, things just aren't like they used to be. Except when it comes to business. For businesses, the bottom line means doing everything within their power to make a profit and grow. That means that many of the traits developed during commercialization have been accelerated in the age of digital press and with even more far-reaching consequences. Rapid consolidation of the media has occurred as the internet continues to create a crisis of profitability for traditional media sources like TV and print. Listen to this. In 1983, there were 50 media organizations. Doesn't seem like a lot, right? I mean, we have 50 states plus more territories in the US. Well, today, we have five. Total, not 25, not 15, five. And in 2012, the President's Council of Economic Advisors described print news media as the fastest shrinking industry. Uh-oh. So what could be bad about so few media outlets? Well, at the time of this lesson's creation, the word on many people's minds is disinformation, or false information presented as real in order to intentionally mislead the public. Professionalism in media has eroded to such a point that YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter shovel out the bulk of news and information to consumers. Let me throw a big term out at you. Manufactured amplification. This term, manufactured amplification, increases disinformation and also increases profitability. Remember the number one goal for businesses? To make a profit. So when a service is free, as is the case for most social media platforms, the platform uses targeted advertising based on user data to make the business profitable. This strategy requires high engagement by users and is supposed to increase the time users spend on the platform, which then increases what is called inventory. Inventory refers to the number of opportunities a platform has to send ads. 
So, how do they keep people on the platforms? Algorithms. No, we unfortunately do not have enough time to go into this high-level calculus concept with you, but rest assured, it works. Platforms have created algorithms that identify and send news or content to users in an attempt to get an emotional response. These highly targeted ads are typically information that reinforces a user's specific perspective of the world. But how could they know that much about a user? Well, that information is readily found in a user's own activity. However, the information these platforms send to users tends to be even more extreme than their users' own perceptions. Now, these platforms may in fact disagree with much of the information sent to their users, but the model itself is based on the competition to maintain users. The effect of manufactured amplification is the creation of an information bubble surrounding users. However, in this algorithm-generated echo chamber, instead of you hearing your voice back, you hear back your voice times 10. Truly, in this online echo chamber, a user's views and thus their biases are constantly reinforced, and many users come to believe the information. Rejecting other views, the user more willingly spreads the information, whether valid or not. Person-to-person -person spread of disinformation is much easier and frequent. An MIT study revealed that disinformation spreads faster through person-to-person -person sharing on social media than through algorithms. In fact, false stories are 70% more likely to be retweeted than true ones. Crazy, right? So why is that? Well, it turns out these stories get more emotional responses because the events they show, whether true or not, showcase disasters, or at least impending disasters. Actors are cast as either heroes or villains. And over time, valid sources and truth are crowded out by the more emotionally appealing false news. It's that time again. Time to show what you know. What trends in media were accelerated by the digital revolution? What new challenges were created by the digital revolution? What is manufactured amplification? Remember the essential question? It was this. What institutions determine the principles and direction of journalism and media in America? Give it a shot and make sure to have your parents or guardians check the answer guide to see how you did. Today we learned that the First Amendment provides a framework for understanding the role of free speech and press in a democracy. We learned that commercialization of media creates challenges for the news as a public good, but also led to the professionalization of journalism. We also learned that digital media presents similar historical challenges, but also new ones. That's it for us today! In the next lesson, we will analyze how the media impacts public opinion in three specific ways. But that's for next time. Have a great rest of your day, and as always, remember to vote, debate, and participate. Hey, hey.